kind of begin on a permanent church. We got a church coming this spring in Quapaw. I've got another minister going to be over it, but I will occasionally go down and preach maybe once a week or so. But he's actually going to be the full time minister down there. And uh, hopefully within the summer we'll get one going in Joplin too. We've got several possibilities there. But it began here, so if you keep the church in your prayers. Like I said, maybe two, two, three, fourths like this. Sometimes it's 15, 20. It don't matter the number. It just matters the heart, you know. Right. So I like to have a place because as you feel it's starting to get kind of cool out. Nice today, but for long, much longer it ain't going to be like this, you know. Yeah. So it's about time to get a building going, you know. <laughs> so, but no, I, if you guys keep that in your prayers, I appreciate it. So I'm, I'm very excited to see the Lord is working there. So he's got a plan. I've also been gifted with the ability to a few contacts that are wanting to do some traveling revivals, and that's something I've been wanting to do for a while. So I can have my men, my network of ministers that I know are faithful come in, you know, preach for me when I'm not around. You know, so they've got sheep in good hands. But uh, I've also been able to get in contact with a few people that's going to put me in touch with food and clothing to help out the community. So drop and walk by in here, all three. Everybody needs help. I mean, the world today is just is ridiculously tough. You know. So if you guys should just keep that in your prayers. Praise be to God. His will be done. We'll get that thing going. And before long, we'll be able to help the community physically, spiritually, you know, any way we can. I mean, the mission I have in mind is not get up, go preach, throw in your 10% of the plate and go on. That's, that's not God's church. That's man's church. I don't seek religion. I seek a relationship. And that's what God wants us to do. That's why he calls us his children. That's why we're grafted by blood. If he could have just bought us and made us slaves, then we would be slaves. That's what he wants to be. When we would just show up to church, we just give our 10%, sing a song, pray a prayer, go home. We're no more than a Pharisee or a Sadducee we're putting on the show. So, before I get started, Claude probably knows this all. He's heard me preach just ranting and raving. <laughs> <laughs> I preach because I preach to my wife, I preach to my mom, I preach to my brother, I preach to my friends. It's just kind of natural. I don't mean to. But I don't, I don't preach a good story but sermon. I go by the word of God, that's the greatest story ever told. So, I'm telling you to this, because you ain't always heard me preach either. So, I go verse by verse, and whatever the Holy Spirit speaks, then I speak. I don't judge you or you or you. I don't, I'm not perfect. I mean, when I poop, it stinks bad enough, you know? Yeah. I put on my shoes, my feet stink. You know, I mean, I'm not perfect, you know? Things happen. So, I don't expect none of you to be perfect. If you guys want a profession church, I think we all know where we can go attend there. So, this ain't one. If you guys would like to go ahead and bow our heads and get the word of God this morning. Dear Holy and Heavenly Father, Lord God, you say where two or more are gathered in your name, Lord, there you are also. Thank you, precious Savior. We thank you for being with us. Father, we ask now that you guide us in your word, that you would give us love and unity, Lord God, as a family, that you would give our hearts an open ear, Lord God, to your word, that you would let it edify our body and our soul, Lord God. For Father God, like sheep, we've all gone astray. And Lord, some are astray now that aren't here today. And, Lord God, there's some in our hearts today, Lord God, we have doubts. I have doubts sometimes, Lord God. It's a human nature, and you know this. Father God, you knit us inside our mother's womb before the foundation of the world. You knew who we were going to be. Father God, we know that you have the power to heal. We know that you have the power to straighten people out, Lord God. And we know you have the power to deliver us financially, Lord. Father God, we pray for everybody, Lord God, on our list and the people worldwide, Lord God. We pray for all the tornado victims of Joplin and the deep south and nationwide. We pray for all those affected by earthquakes and typhoons and plagues and diseases everywhere, Father. Father God, we just ask that you lift up your children of the world, Lord. That you forget us not, Lord. And though we do go astray sometimes, Lord, I pray that where they be here or worldwide, Lord God, or where they be right now, that you would just let your precious blood come with it from head to toe. Every hair on your head, Lord God, soak them in your holy blood. Father, we thank you for all that you do in our lives, Lord. And we give you blessings and glory right now, Lord God. And we pray that what we do, you find, you find pleasing, Lord. Thank you so much, Father. In the name of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, we pray for these things now. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be starting in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For those of you that don't know, Romans is my favorite book. You've got that camera's position right for all the folks at home? Yep. Okay. You guys know as I record my services here. Because we do have many worldwide viewers, God love them. And they just sometimes, we got a lot of shepherds today leading people astray. They're more ashamed of Jesus Christ and more proud of their churches than they are. They should be more proud of the Lord. They should be more proud that they have been sanctified and set aside for use for God. They should be more proud that they have been saved by the redemptive blood of Christ. But we got preachers and church folk alive today that are powering and fighting their they're standing at the pulpit of pimping you for cash. That's what they want. They want to build the bigger churches. I mean, I'm just tickled people preaching out the open myself. But there ain't many like that today. Not that I'm better than them. God bless them. I pray the Lord moves within their heart. The problem is they are 
church members have fallen astray because our pastors have fallen astray. We got pastors judging the church, we got pastors judging pastors, we got church members judging church members, church members judging sinners, sinners judging church members. Why do I know there's a whole bunch of hypocrites? Well, you're judging them, so you're a hypocrite. Come on in, we got room for one more. Yeah, that's kind of how it is. But what we need today is a great awakening in America. We need more pastors like the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, that will stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. The preachers aren't doing this today. They're, oh no, we don't dare speak about homosexuality. Oh no. We don't dare speak about cheating on our wife. We don't dare talk about doing the drugs. You know, we don't do this thing without well, fill up that plate. Well, if you guys will notice, I don't have a plate up here. I could care less about the money. The Lord will bless me the way I need bless. I don't got a pen from his pulpit. So starting in Romans 1.16, reading out the King James Version of the Bible, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The Greek can also be translated into sub notes and it says to the Gentile. We know here that we are Gentiles, saved by the blood of Jesus, as we just talked about. The Lord loves us greatly. He sent his only begotten Son to die, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord does not intend for no one to perish in the sins of the flesh. The old man is crushed down in the grave of Jesus when we confess him as our Savior and we're baptized into his name. The new man grows up. For the flesh lives by flesh, and the spirit lives by the spirit. The problem today is, church folk, is we're not living by the spirit of God. We're letting the lust of the flesh overtake us. It may not even be a sexual sin. Most will be the first to jump on sexual sin. It may not be sexual sin. We could be letting our TV get in our way. We could be letting our computers get in our way. We could be letting our alcohol get in our way. We could be letting our family get in our way. We can very well make a family member an idol if we don't wash ourselves. We got to keep our eye on the Christ and not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We got to keep in mind we are here to love the Lord God first and foremost. Seventeen says, "For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith." For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Notice he doesn't say some ungodliness. He says all ungodliness. The Lord desires that we love him with a pure heart. He's not saying you're going to be sinless. He's not saying you're going to slip, not going to slip and bump your knees. He's saying, love me with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. What is Jesus' second and greatest commandment? He says, love thy neighbor as thyself. If we are not loving our neighbor, we do not love ourselves indeed. We cannot do it. For if we hate the man that we can physically see, how can we say that we love our God, which we have never seen, but we trust by faith? For the just shall live by faith. It says in verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, or made known to them, for God hath showed it unto them. 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That right verse, verse 20 of chapter 1 alone totally thumps evolution on the head and makes every scholar that says we came from monkeys and crawled out of the ocean look like a complete stupid. Not an opinion, that's the fact. He says, if we see the things that were created from the beginning, when we see these things, we see the trees out here today, this beautiful outdoor gathering. We see how the flowers, how they bloom and how they die, yet they come again the next spring. We see how we go through a drought after the tornado this summer. And all the crops die yet. Here comes the fall rain. And you see everything in the life yet again. We see these things and we know that God is here. So why can we not see when we become dry and droughtful in our lives that the Lord God is working within us, that just as he has made us try because we have fallen away from him, that he can once again send the spiritual rain and lift us up again. Verse 21 says, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. How many of us, me and myself, I can testify for a and foremost, start to get a little bit of clock to themselves, get a little bit out of debt, maybe get a nicer car or a nicer home, and all of a sudden we just seem to forget about God. We forget He was ever there. We forget who gave us these blessings. We've seen this in the Jewish church in the Old Testament. He gave them a land flowing with milk and honey, delivered them out of the bondage of sin and slavery in Egypt. What did they do? They weren't gone as desert more than seven, eight days. Man, they were bigger. We're hungry. We're thirsty. Oh, we're going to starve to death. You ain't going to starve. You ain't going to die of thirst. 
Trust in your father. If he just delivered you out 400 years of slavery, I think he has the ability to feed you in a desert. You know, I mean, come on. We today do the same thing. We do just a little bit of going for us. And we forget about our father who gave it to us. 22 says, professing themselves to be wise, but they became, be wise, they became fools. 23, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creepings. That's speaking of idol worship. We may not necessarily have golden idols, per se, in our house that we bow to and pray to, or like in our son do, believe it or not, but we may not. But we are making God and our, the church into a man-made world, like it's saying here. We think, well, if the church is whitewashed and beautiful and don't have a stain on the wall, we ain't supposed to have a stain either. Well, no, you're not supposed to, but you're going to, and God knows that. That's the reason for grace. If you're going to attain perfection and keep perfect in life and never screw up, there'd been no need for Jesus on the cross. The following the Ten Commandments alone could have saved you, there'd been no need for Jesus on the cross. The fact is, we follow the Ten Commandments out of an eagerness and an obedient heart, showing that we have Christ in us. That's why we follow them, or we try to our best. And if we slip, once again, we have grace, we have repentance. We know it's not a license to sin, but if we do mess up, we're not cast out for good. We're not down and out. We're just down. We can get back in. 24 says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. 25 says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the, creator more than the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We have done this. Sadly, the whole world has done this. This whole world is sick and disgusting. All you got to do if you think the world ain't sick is turn on CNN and give yourself one hour and you will be ready to jump off a cliff. It's that simple. We have turned from the goodness that God has gave us. God gave us, like an old joke, I heard angel food cake and the devil says, here's chocolate. He gave us olive oil and the devil says, oh, here's Crisco. It melts a whole lot quicker. You know, things like that. We've done this in our hearts. God has given us goodness, love, compassion, charity, peaceable things of earth. And we've turned it into hate and contentiousness. He gave us woman to be beside our side. Not from our butt, because she's our rear. Not from our feet <laughs> to be below us, or our head to be above us. But he gave it out and dribbed the woman to make her beside us. To be a helpmate. That if we're out working the yard, our wives are with us helping us. If she's in there cooking, then we're in there cooking with her. You know, we are to be a helper one another, but men have corrupted these things and turned them into lust, and we see women today, and the women see us men likewise as just an object of sexual pleasure. 26 says, For this cause God gave them up into vile affections. Vile. Nasty, filthy, deadly affections. For even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, having the natural use of, leaving the natural use of woman, Burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working out which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was mean. I don't know how many preachers today have heard say, it's okay to be gay. Flat out your gay pride. Now, I have nothing against the gay person. Nothing personal at all. I have a half sister that is homosexual. I love her with my heart and soul. Do I love her sin? No. I hate the sin because I know where it's sending her. I know what has changed her mind to. I see where it's going. I believe in my heart that homosexuality is a demon possession of the latter days and it's let you know I'm like a plague. I know it's been around for a while, but it's worse than it's ever been. So do I hate the homosexual? No. I pray for him. I love the sinner and I hate the sin. That's how we've got to be as human beings. When a brother errors in their way and they fall astray or they do something to wrong us, don't hate the brother or the sister, but hate what has happened. And then with a willing and eager heart, if God gave you grace, so show them grace. Give them forgiveness. Help them turn from the error of their way. 28 says that even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. In other words, he gave them a refusing mind, an evil mind, a mind to go against him. Now, it's not hard to see what we're doing today when we read on 29. It says, being full of all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, and covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, Debate, deceit, malignity, and whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Amongst all those things, you know, right in the middle of those are haters of God. And it kind of neat that 
the Lord inspired Paul to write that in the midst of all those different evil things that the human heart conjures up in itself. Because if you do any of those, you hate God. You hate your brother, you hate God. You steal, you hate God. You murder, you hate God. For sin is sin. There is no greater sin, no lesser sin. There is no white light, there's no big fat whopper. They're all a sin, they're all a lie. There is no little bitty, well, I didn't mean to murder him in Burger. Well, I didn't mean to get high and run over this girl in the street. Well, you still did it, you know. That's how it is with the Lord. You hate God if you do these things. Our heart causes us to do these things. So if the flesh is working within man, and the carnal things are coming through man, then we're going to live by the carnal things. But if we have a repentant heart, and we know the things of God, and then we live for Christ Jesus who died and lived for us, then we start to deny these things. We hear that God is, when we're watching that Tommy Carter, he said, you get a little uncomfortable. Me today, I'll tell you right now, I've got 300 some channels for 50 bucks a month. I watch maybe three of them, and half the time I don't watch three because even the gospel stations are getting a little foul. It's not that I'm better than now. I don't like those things. If I watch sex on TV, I'm going to be tempted to go look at the woman down the street and maybe touch it. If I go watching <laughs> liquor and drinking on TV, I'm an ex-alcoholic. I'm going to want to go get back. If I go watching drugs on TV, my wife is an ex-meth addict. She's going to want to go get high. It's going to bring back those lust of man within us. If I go watching this guy beat this other guy down, man, I'm going to get all pumped up. First time my neighbor says, well, you did this. I said, no, I'm going to put him down. The Lord does not call these things. He says, being filled with all unrighteousness in 29, all unrighteousness. Today, do we know what righteousness truly is? Righteousness means holy living. Living to please God. Not meaning you're never going to fart and stink up the house. <laughs> not meaning you're not going to slip and have a beer now and then. Not meaning you're not going to light up when you get tempted. That means that you're going to do these things constantly. That's unrighteousness. That means you're not even going to try to come against them. That's unrighteousness. But when we don't have that record of mind and we live for God, then we fight these things. We have the guilt to know the things that we do here are wrong. Then we know we are living in righteousness because we're seeking to change those things. We're seeking not to live in them. Jesus died on that Calvary. Why did he die on Calvary? Do you think he wanted to that cross? Do you think he wanted whip and scores and cat and nine tails? No. That was your whipping, brothers and sisters. That was my nails that he felt. That was my spear on the side that he was pierced with. Because we deserve those things because we are vile people. We do live in sin. We do constantly sin. We do hate our brother. We do walk against our fellow men. We do walk against the ways of the world. And trust me, I don't agree with the laws that Mr. Obama's passed, but he is our president. Does it mean I love the man? No. <laughs> I would vote for the monkey down the street. And I mean literally the monkey. Before I vote for Mr. Obama again. But do I pray for the man? Yes, I do. Because that's the man that God has seen fit for whatever reason to put in power. Since he's the Antichrist, he may be. If not, there are many Antichrists that came. The Bible says that too, and many more will come before the big one. He may be one of them. Either way, I pray for him. That's the duty of a good Christian. That's the duty of brotherly love. That is the duty of any who confess Christ Jesus as their Savior. Pray and love thy fellow man. 31 says, without understanding, covenant breaker, without natural affection, implacable, implacable, unmerciful. How many of you, now this is a true question, folks, I, I'm not picking on no one, I'm being myself here. When our fellow man walks out and kicks us in the shin or going to smile and say, God bless you, what's your first reaction? You're going to knock them cold or you're going to put their nerves purple. That's the fact. Cool. But he says, we are unmerciful creatures, that's the carnal nature. What we got to do, as hard as it is, and this is probably the hardest test I will mention today, is as Jesus did. When they beat him, whipped him, spit on him, called him names. He could have called down legions of angels from heaven, lifted himself off the cross, and bent down and whipped every one of the butt with his daddy. He never needed to raise a finger. But he didn't. He was merciful. Because he says, I speak not of my own things, nor do I give you commandments of my own, but I witness of what the Father has said to me. He told us what God had told him. He told us the things of God, how to live like God. Because to be God's children, you've got to live like God. 
If our parents raised us right, and there ain't one of us sitting here today that ain't got a butt busting or a whooping. If our parents did this out of love, then how much more is God going to do this to us out of love? Sometimes bad things happen to wake up the sinner. Sometimes they just happen to test the sinner. Sometimes you ain't done a thing wrong. Look at old Job. God loved him. He lost everything. He had his house blown down. All his kids died. He and his wife said, why don't you just curse God? Job could have cursed God. Would have done him any good? Not only would he lost everything, and then it sin still because he cursed God. But he did not curse God. He did not sin against God. How many of us have ever lost something we love and we come against God? God, why? What are you doing? Why are you thinking? Why are you doing this to me? I love you. I tithe 10%. I sing louder than the freaking choir. Why are you punishing me? He ain't always punishing you, brothers and sisters. Sometimes he's testing you. Who has ever been panning for gold? Myself, eh? When you get that gold, it's not so shiny and pretty always. It's got dirt mixed in it, kind of dingy. But when you get a bunch of gold together, you put it in a pot and you put fire to it, then all the bad floats to the top, you skim it off, and you've got a pure, beautiful, shiny gold bar full of color and light. We as a church folk, God has called us out of this filthy ground. He does not wish for us to decay in the ground like a body or like that stone. He has called us to be united as one brethren, whether it's here in the park, Mr. Claus and Tylene's home, in my backyard, or we be in a church up the street, the Lord God, Jesus Christ above, has called us to go into that pot. He adds the fire. Oh my God, we're losing our car. We're losing our home. My wife is leaving me. Oh my God, I'm out of drink. I don't have a bottle. Jesus Christ, where do I go now? The cross. <laughs> yep. You go to the cross. Same boys are, oh, you poor thing. He never loved you anyway. Go watch a porno. You'll never miss her. Well, you go in there and you do your thing. You get jumped up behind the mango tree. And you know what? 30 minutes later, you're missing your wife again. <laughs> I've been there. I come home by my wife and gave me ring. Went out to Stratford, Missouri, and I drove out there and picked out a pretty little ring. Called my wife to make sure of her finger size. The phone rang. No answer. Oh, no answer. Phone rang again. No answer. I started getting a little worried because my lecture was playing light bulbs. Now I get out flying back to scream my mom telling you my mom's car and I suck a peg out a hundred ways. Right through a work zone. I don't care who's behind me. Popo can flip on his lights and follow me home. I get home, no wife. Computer on, dishes in the sink. No wife, no nothing. Hey, no. Think your God was going to Can I sign my neighbor down She said, cat pulled up to me. I said, cat? She said, yeah. So I said, your God, what's going on? So I go rushing around town trying to find her. Can't find her. Finally got to the Greyhound bus station and said, yeah, she left Brady, California 30 minutes ago. I said, I thought, why? Well, me and my wife were talking on the phone a few days later. She got stuck in Vegas, nearly knocked out a black guy. Another girl started <laughs> making fun of her. She nearly knocked in cold. <laughs> she got me kicked off the bus. I need a bus ticket home. <laughs> so I found out why. I didn't pay attention to my wife. She had been crying out the need that morning. In my own eagerness and cockiness, I'm the man. I ignored my wife. When I hung up that phone, her eyes bust into tears and her heart broke into two pieces. And she left. And then I realized she wasn't the victim. I was the victim. I was the idiot that had lost something. She was ready to say, forget it. I was the moron. Today, Jesus Christ is hard to break and wide open. He's saying, I've called you and you can't pick up the phone. I went out and I've got you more than a beautiful ring. I hung on Calvary. I have washed your filthy black butt clean with that red, red blood. You are now white as snow on a December day. He's saying, why don't you pick up the phone to me? Why don't we pick up the phone? Because we're too busy judging ourselves. We're too busy judging one another. We're too busy working nine to five. We're too busy paying the rent. We don't pay attention to Jesus. We have gotten that vain attitude that the Apostle Paul is speaking of here in our hearts. We have become so conceited with ourselves, we have made ourselves fair. We are an idol under God. We worship ourselves. We don't care what our fellow man thinks. 
And when we see our fellow man across the street sin, <coughs> we're so quick to sit there and say, look at what he did. Look at the way his wife is dressed. What are they doing? We're not godly enough to walk across the street and say, hey, what's going on? Somebody can help you with it? Don't judge him. It's really easy to judge a person turn away from Christ. The true test of discipleship comes when you're willing to look. Look at John. Here's a couple other disciples. But we mention John above all. Jesus called him the son of thunder. Everywhere he went, man, he was, man, he was stopping up a storm, calling down curses on trees that didn't produce fruit. He was ticked off. He was ready to tell you where it was. This is my Savior. You're over here. You're going to hell. But Jesus called him the son of thunder. But you know what? Before he died, he was called the disciple of love. The vanity of youth, the vanity of health, had deceived his heart and he didn't even realize it. Just like Pharaoh of all the plagues that came against Egypt. Let my people go. More plagues. Let my people go. Pharaoh is still hard in his heart today. The Lord is saying, let the sin go. Let it go. You do not need it. You do not need idols. You do not need the prostitution. You do not need the bottle. You need me. I don't judge you today if you drink, smoke, or do drugs, or head to the whorehouse when you leave. That's too many you don't. I love you regardless. But the Lord is gentle calling today. Judging others condemns us. Chapter 2 tells us this. Yep. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. Whatsoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou hast judged, thou hast judged to do us the same things. How can I judge one of you right now for leaving your husband or your wife, for picking a child over your husband? My wife knows about that. For picking your friends over your wife, I know about that. Picking your family over your name. Picking your job over your fellow man. Picking yourself over your fellow man. He says, how can you judge others when you do the same things? How can you judge the whore down the street when you are a whoremonger yourself? How can you judge the one who drinks at the bottle when you yourself used to love that nightlife? Man, I love the boogie. Discernment and judging are two different things. So many pastors today, one of the reasons I decided to go into the ministry and the Lord called me so clearly, I was so sick and tired of being judged, I didn't care if I ever walked inside one of those little white steeples ever again. Lofty people under lofty steeples. But if you're now wash him clothes white, judge thy fellow man as he walks down the street reeking up whatever it is. But you know what's funny? Of all the times I was ever judged, I'm sure a couple of you probably thought this too, maybe all of you. Every time I was ever judged, the very people inside the church that judged me on Sunday were the very ones I was partying with the J Town Sports and Billiards on Monday. I was like, wow, look at here, ain't this the preacher? My dad one time went and asked the minister for some help. My dad wasn't real able to keep a job. He had a lot of mental problems. You guys know my dad. And he went and asked the minister for a little bit of help. He said, I can't ever help you again, Bob. He said, sir, how come? He said, my wife seen you inside the liquor store buying cigarettes for your wife. Can you tell me what's wrong with that sentence? His wife is in the liquor store. He would have. The pastor's going to judge another man for being in the liquor store. Should he first be judging and asking why his wife was in there? So before any of us can sit up here and preach, we have to learn to walk. Before we can run, we have to learn to crawl, right? We have to learn to walk. How many of you today are willing to quit judging your neighbor? How many of you willing to start judging yourself first? And then you won't judge your neighbor, but you'll clearly discern and love and try to help you. You don't say, well, you're doing this, this, and this. You say, hey, this ain't quite right. This is what Scripture says. See, a lot of times a preacher will preach. People start itching in their pews. Oh, I don't like that judgmental son. But, you know, I'm going home. I've been there myself. Oh, man, that music's too loud. My ears are ringing. Woo! Man, she went to bed a little earlier last night, you know. Maybe I shouldn't have had that last beer. Maybe I shouldn't have had that extra bottle of Jack. I've been there a few. But you know what? It ain't the preacher judging always. Sometimes it is. And I'll tell you, I've got a bone for some judgmental preachers, and I'll tell them where to go real quick with the word of God. But oftentimes, when you find a true minister of a true church, one that preaches the Bible, nothing but the Bible, not the theology, you'll find that that itchy feeling in your pew is the Holy Spirit convicting the sin within you. The preacher's job is not to make the church want to fall asleep. I'm not supposed to make you cozy and comfy and sing you a song or two. 
I'm supposed to get in some gym with the Holy Spirit. If you're feeling your judgment today, trust now I don't judge you. I don't care what you do. I love you regardless, and I'll stick beside you regardless. I don't care if you're out in the pig pen smell like Waller. I don't care if you're down in the bar up here at Taylor's. I'll come down and visit you there, and I'll have a cup while you drink your beer. I love my fellow men. I've been in his shoes. I've been the whoremonger chasing the tail around the square. I've been the drunk drinking the bottle. I've been the man that's raised up his hand and boxed his wife's stupid. Do I love that man? No, I hate that man. I crucify that man daily, and I can't seem to let that go. But i got to learn to forgive myself, the words of the dear friend. Because before I can help others, I've got to help myself. Before I can expect others to be faithful to their mates, i got to be faithful to my mates. Before I can help others out of the bottle, I've got to learn to overcome the bottle and not be tempted by it. Which, praise be the Lord, I've overcame that part. That's a good step. Verse 2 says, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. So when we're starting to feel that itching in the, in the Holy Spirit, we're sitting in church. Do we jump up and run or should we stop, sit still, hold ourselves in that city, and see what the Holy Spirit has to say today? For Jesus' disciple about 2,000 years ago was crying that he was about to die. He was less than a day away. If they were crying as he said he was going where he was going, they couldn't come. They wasn't bothering to ask him, where are you going? How can I come? They were just crying as they couldn't come. Jesus says, but lo, you can't. He says, for if I do not go, the Father will not send the great comfort. See, as long as Jesus was here, they were going to hate him. They hated him while he was here. As long as we're preaching the truth or living righteousness, our neighbors and our fellow men are going to hate us. This town hates my living guts. And you know what? I don't care. I really let it bother me just a few weeks ago. But witnessing a few good friends and a couple here today, I thought, you know why do I really give a crap what they think about me? Are they my judge, jury, or executioner? Are they going to lift me up into eternal glory? Does your judgment mean a lick? I'm not no seeker of men, because the Lord is not no seeker of men. We go on down here, and verse 3 says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Who are you to judge your fellow man when you live like your fellow man, and you think you're going to be forgiven? We all know one man, I'm speaking up right now, but one of the biggest judgmental hypocrites in this friggin' town. He's judging all these God bless the sheep out here. I mean, God bless you. We are blessed by God. We know we are wrong. We're here today because we know we've got wrongs in our lives. I'm up here preaching today because I know I've had wrong, and I'm still battling wrongs. I am not perfect. You are not perfect. We're not going to be perfect until we receive that eternal body of glory like Jesus Christ. He says, how do you think you're going to escape judgment when you do the same things as them? Verse 4 says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God will give to you to repentance. Why has the Lord not split the sky yet? Bright crowds of glory and trumpets, angels and armed with swords, fire ready to push the evil up into hell? Because of his forbearance, his foreseeing, he has been dealing with us since the beginning of time, and he's going to deal with us a little bit longer. And his long-suffering means what we put through God, he is suffering. When we hate and destroy and kill and maim and talk bad about us behind the back and judge others and think evil of others, we are re-crucifying our Savior to the cross. Any of you ever heard the song called Do You Feel Still the Nails by Ray Bolts? Yep. Do you feel the nails? Every time we do this to our fellow men or to ourselves, we're re-crucifying our Savior. But his forbearance gives us time because he seeks none to perish. Five says, but after thy hardness, and a pit that hard treasures up uh, worm chapter two, by the way. But after thy hardness and a pit of hard treasures up unto thyself, wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of righteousness, of righteous judgment of God. Six says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds? We either so see the love, kindness, forgiveness, mercifulness, happiness, grace to our men like God has given us grace, grace to our families, grace to our friends. Are we so our own seeds of wrath, envy, hate, strife, and murders? That's real easy to hold a grudge against a person. Real easy. Satan's not equipped us with that well, but he's embedded to us so long we like it. But the true test is when we forgive our fellow man. When we know we have wronged them or they have wronged us, but we're willing to let that go. Because 
Because there's not a one of us here that ain't sinned and ain't been forgiven of God when we ask. So should we not likewise forgive our fellow men when they do us wrong? Should we not mirror image our Savior? Chapter 6 says, like I said, who will render to every man according to his deeds, so we can either render mercifulness to God by giving mercy to others, or we can render wrath and hate like we are given to others. Do it to them as you would have them do unto you, because how you do to others is how God is going to do to you. 7 says, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. What do we seek? We seek glory in God, not glory in man. We seek eternal life in God, not eternal life in the world. We seek immortality of God, not immortality of witchcraft or darkness. Verse 8 says, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey the, right, the unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that do of evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. Christ appeared first to the Jews because of God's promise of Abraham. God cannot lie to himself. God cannot break his promise. God cannot deny himself. So he appeared first to the Jews. He knew that the Jews would reject his son as a whole. But to fulfill his promise to Abraham, he came first to the Jews. But it says also secondly to the Greek, which is translated also to the Gentile. We are Gentiles, secondly to us. So if we give love, he's going to give love to the Gentile and the Jew alike. If we give hate, he's going to give hate to the Jew and the Gentile alike. There's a lot of Jews out there preaching, and I do love the Jewish nation that support Israel strongly. But they think because they're Jews, they're going to get away with their wrongdoings and able to afford God's sins. It says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Everyone that does evil. It don't matter how much you tithe. It don't matter if you're a record of church. God's not sitting there with a squirt guard in the home room saying, Verse we're doing here today says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men 
by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So I got me here all back. Do you really believe the Bible? It was written by men. I, I don't know about that. Yeah, I believe every word of Genesis and Revelation. Because I believe it is the true inspired will of God. The word of God. The living word. Handed down command to write for us today. You tell me an almighty God who created heavens and earth and brought the Jews out of bondage and delivered us through his son's blood to destroy the book if that wasn't what he wanted? Oh yeah, he can destroy that book. I believe in that book. But above all, I believe in the state of the words that come out of that book. Today, folks, I want to ask you, would you instead of being hearers of the word, we can memorize the Ten Commandments, we can chant it, we can own a million Bibles, and I've got a good start on it. That don't save us, folks. When we do the words of those Bibles we love so much, that we carry with us like cell phones, and praise God we do it. When we do those, when we are doers of the law, and here's the law, then we are truly living righteousness as God wants us to live. I ask today, when you hear the call of Christ, this week, when you go forth about your way, when you share the word of Jesus with one stranger each day, if you can. One a week, you speak the word of God. Pray in public. Somebody tell you to know this, don't say, well, I'll pray for you. Say, well, hey, let's pray. Let's pray. That's hard. Not long ago, I faced a temptation in Walmart where I wanted to do that. There's people staring at I backed up, sadly. I'll admit it. I got out of the car, man. I felt so dang deep and dirty. I thought, I got back out on my God. There are a lot of people staring when he hung for me. And I jumped my fat butt back out the car, and my brother jumped out with me, and we ran back up there, and we prayed in the parking lot. We looked like a bunch of random and raving fools, but we felt better. <laughs> we knew we had done the will of God. This week, I asked one thing, that you all be hearers of the word. But when you hear the word, be a doer of the word. Love thy fellow man. Get rid of all the envy in your hearts. As the words of a friend told me to forgive myself, I ask you guys to forgive yourselves and forgive others. Jesus has done washed away the sin. So why are we out rolling? Folks, today I ask you, is there anybody here that needs prayer? Anybody here needs a lane or an unspoken request? I have to offer that all the call if I don't, and the blood is upon my hands. If not, just give me an amen and let me know, and we'll be closing heading out of here. Is everybody free with their own conscience today? Does everybody think we can try harder to be doers of the word of God? Right, if you folks would, would you please stand with me for the closing prayer for the monitor of the Lord and say, if you can't stand, that's fine. Let me sip the water real quick and shut it down on your face. Oh, precious and heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you, glorious Father, for all that you have done. Lord Jesus, we give our lives to you right now, Father. For you say all have sinned and gone astray. For you say if we say we have no sin, we have done deceived ourselves. Father God, Mark 2, 17, the reason I stand here today with us for you says that if you have not come to call the righteous, but you have called the sinner to repentance. Father God, why do not want to stand here today and be praised of men? Father God, nobody here today is came through your word to be praised of men. We have came with eagerness and humbleness as you asked us, Lord. We have come on our best that we can give you on the Sabbath, and we have given you our best that we can on the Sabbath. Father God, we pray that you see that the way you want it to be. Father God, if there is any injustice in our hearts, there are any evil, strivings, hatings, Lord God, if there are any murderous intentions in our heart, Father, if there be any sin or guile thoughts or guileless words in our mouth or our hearts, Father, we ask right now that you take the life-giving blood of Jesus and that you atone us one each other, Lord God. Father God, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Yes. You're your brother's keeper. Not your brother's judge, your brother's keeper. Father God, we ask that you help us to lift up our brethren. That you touch the brothers and the sisters here and the ones at home hearing this message. Father God, we pray right now that your gospel be preached into the world. That all who hear it would have the eagerness in their heart and the edification of the Holy Spirit to give their lives over to you. Lord, it don't matter if we've repented a hundred times or a thousand times or if this is our first time coming to Calvary, Lord. Lord, we look to the cross and we see your blood-stained hands. Father God, we don't have to see to believe as we feel it, Father God. That tugging we feel within our hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that is your Holy Spirit working within us, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the life that you have given. Father, we thank you for another day, Lord, that you have given that none should perish, 
Lord Jesus, we know you have cast our sin as far as the east is to the west. But Father God, we ask right now that our hearts be cast from the east to the west. Because Father God, though you have washed us white, we're still rolling in the mud and the filth of the sin. And Jesus, we ask for your, your overcoming of that temptation, Lord God, to hold us back and so easily beset us. Father, you yourself was tempted in the wilderness 40 days, Lord God, by Satan and all that he can give. And Father, we are in the wilderness, Lord. The light is closing out. The churches are going dim. The pastors are hiding behind their pulpit. The churches are staying home. The daddies are hitting the mamas, and the mamas are cheating on the daddies, Lord God. The babies are on the bottle. The drugs are in the church. The drugs are in the street. And Lord God, we pray right now that you would lift up your people. Father God, that you would give them the love that you have. That you would give them the forgiveness of your heart, Lord God, for themselves and for one another that you have on Calvary. For Father, you said, Father, forgive them. Jesus, you said, forgive them. You did not curse them. And Lord God, we ask right now that you not let us curse others or ourselves, Father. Father God, we ask for your guiding and your protection, Lord God. Oh Lord, thank you. We ask you to be with us as we go forth in this week. That you would give us all the things that we need, Lord God. Food in our stomach and shelter over our head. But oh, Lord God, that you would give us your love. Love ye one another. Let us be doers of your word. Father God, in all these things now we close and go our way until we meet again, Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that gift of life. In your holy and precious name, Jesus Christ, we ask all these things now, Father God. Amen. Amen. Thank you folks so much for